Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ambassador Milan Revere, Executive Director, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Good morning, uh, everyone, and we're so sorry for the weather delays, uh, but so happy the, that you're all here, uh, and we want to welcome you to Smart Power Security Through uh, Inclusive Leadership. A special welcome to all of our guests who've come from around the globe uh, to Georgetown to participate in this program, some from as far as Afghanistan, the Philippines, Ghana, Japan, and so many other places, from organizations like NATO and the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and from here at home, many US government officials and the extended Georgetown family. I want to note especially the presence of so many members of the diplomatic corps who are with us and I want to thank you even more for the leadership you have given uh, to these issues. And if you are tweeting, please join the conversation at hashtag SmartPower. We are especially delighted to welcome back to Georgetown Secretary Clinton, who has been a leader on the issues that we are here to discuss today. It was in this room on December the 3rd, just three years ago, that she traveled here from the State Department to launch the first ever U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security that focused on the role of women in ending conflict and building lasting peace. At the time, she called the U.S. commitment a comprehensive roadmap for accelerating and institutionalizing efforts across the U.S. government to advance women's participation in making and keeping peace. How we can more effectively execute our diplomatic defense and development operations. And she added, we know that women in peacekeeping is both the right thing to do and the smart thing as well. Today, over 40 countries, NATO and the European Union have action plans. And representatives of 10 of those countries are with us today as they will be over the next two and a half days to focus on how they can better implement their plans and learn from each other. We are happy to be partnering in this project with the Institute for Inclusive Security and the Clinton Foundation's No Ceilings Initiative. Secretary Clinton has been instrumental in the creation of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. She is our honorary chair, and she has generously shared her time with us. And today, we are happy to welcome her back for this program. Please welcome Secretary Clinton. Thank you. Th thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I told my husband this morning that I was going to Georgetown. He said, you've been to Georgetown more in the past two years than I have been. <laughs> I said, well, I consider that uh, a great honor and opportunity. So once again, it is wonderful to be here on this campus and to have a chance to further the uh, work that has been done by our government along with other governments uh, and the incredibly important role that Ambassador Milan Verveer and the Institute of Women, Peace, and Security is playing. Uh, this is the first such institute uh, of its kind at uh, a leading American university, and I'm very pleased that it's going to be replicated in our own country and uh, abroad. I also want to thank Ambassador Swanee Hunt the founder and chair of the Institute for Inclusive Security, for her dedication to ensuring that women are more fully integrated into the process of making peace and keeping peace around the world. Uh, Swanee's Institute is at that uh, small uh, university uh, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, 
I'm also pleased to be joined by Ambassador Wanda Nesbitt from the National Defense University, who will be speaking shortly about an exciting new book that uh, the National Defense University is releasing today. And I want uh, to thank Ambassador Nesbitt for her years of service uh, representing the United States around the world. We are here today uh, with leaders from Afghanistan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Canada, Ghana, Indonesia, Japan, the Netherlands, Norway, Serbia, and of course the United States. In a few minutes, I'll have the honor of introducing the defense minister from Norway. Each of these countries and the people representing them have their stories to share and wisdom to impart about how we make and keep peace, and you will hear more specifics from the distinguished panelists later this morning. Now, this gathering today here at Gaston Hall has been many years in the making. You could trace its roots to 1995 when uh, the uh, world, 189 nations, adopted a platform for action for the full participation uh, for women at the UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing that included a chapter on women and armed conflict. At the time, it was considered quite unusual to include such a chapter. It wasn't just uh, meant as window dressing, it was meant to raise the serious concerns as we had come to see them over time, that war had changed and conflict had morphed so that women and children were the primary victims of most modern conflicts. In 2000, the international community took a major step by adopting UN Security Council Resolution 1325. My distinguished predecessor, um, Professor, Secretary Madeleine Albright went to the United Nations Security Council to introduce and advocate for this resolution, which affirmed the participation of women in peace and security efforts. So we were beginning to lay a groundwork, and over the years that followed, uh, countries began developing national action plans to implement Resolution 1325. We launched the United States' plan right here at Georgetown three years ago. And earlier this year, we stood on this stage and made a commitment to launch a series of practical discussions on the implementation of national action plans that we are calling the National Action Plan Academy. Now, why is this necessary? Well, because you can see, in less than 20 years, we have moved from a general statement of approval for considering the complexity of the issues around women and armed conflict, to the, national, to, to the national debates that that generated, to the UN uh, and the Security Council adopting a resolution. We followed that up in 2008 with a resolution uh, championed by another of my predecessors, uh, Secretary Condi Rice, to focus specifically on uh, the dangers to women uh, because of gender-based violence and sexual violence, and then I was privileged to represent the United States again at the Security Council during my tenure uh, to call for the uh, institution of a representative to the Secretary General to begin at the UN level uh, to try to implement what were the sentiments and the aspirations behind these uh, actions. So the Academy will provide much needed trainings and workshops through the collaboration of the Institute for Inclusive Security at Harvard, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, and the Clinton Foundation's No Ceilings Initiative. Today marks a very important next step, shifting from saying the right things to doing the right things putting into action the steps that are necessary to not only protect women and children, but to find ways of utilizing women as makers and keepers of peace. Because here's what the evidence shows us, and it's really exciting to see the work being done here at Georgetown at the Institute, putting together a curriculum, 
uh, that really focuses on what we know. I'm a big believer in trying to make decisions based on evidence wherever possible, and that is what the Institute has gathered uh, together. So we know when women contribute in making and keeping peace, entire societies enjoy better outcomes. We know when women participate in the peace processes, often overlooked issues like human rights, individual justice, national reconciliation, economic renewal are often brought to the forefront. Women leaders, it has been found, are good at building coalitions across ethnic and sectarian lines and speaking up for other marginalized groups. I saw that in Northern Ireland, I saw that in Central America, I saw that uh, certainly in uh, the Congo, I saw that in Bosnia-Herzegovina. They act more as mediators to help foster compromise and to try to organize to create the changes they seek. So it's important to underscore this overriding fact. Women are not just victims of conflict. They are agents of peace and agents of change. Consider what has happened recently in the Philippines. Mindanao, the second largest island in the Philippines, has been locked in a 40-year conflict. The Moro Islamic Liberation Front was battling the government. More than 120,000 lives were lost. Hope for peace was all but gone when two strong women, Teresita Quintas Deles and Miriam Coronel Ferrer, took over the negotiations. They made inclusivity their mantra. And thanks greatly to their efforts, finally a peace was brokered in a historic deal. This is what we call smart power, using every possible tool and partner to advance peace and security, leaving no one on the sidelines, showing respect even for one's enemies, trying to understand and insofar as psychologically possible, empathize with their perspective and point of view, helping to define the problems, determine the solutions. That is what we believe in the 21st century will change change the prospects for peace. Yet in too many places, the promise of women's participation remains largely unfulfilled. Again, look at the numbers. Of the hundreds of peace treaties that have been signed since the early 1990s, some between nations, some within nations, as we saw with the Philippines, fewer than 10% had any women negotiators. Fewer than 3% had any women signatories. And is it any wonder that many of these agreements fail within a few years? Legal and structural barriers still prevent women from participating in conflict resolution and peace process processes. Cultural norms, real or frankly imagined, often create physical threats that prevent them from attaining a formal role. But these barriers are not insurmountable. Nearly 50 countries have adopted national action plans to implement Resolution 1325 and provide roadmaps for including more women. A number of other countries are in the process of developing their plans, and we're seeing some encouraging results. Here in the United States, for instance, the Pentagon and the State Department are working together to promote efforts like the Global Peace Operations Initiative to improve the effectiveness of United Nations peace operations. In Norway, um, and I, I appreciate very much having the defense minister here, uh, she belongs to a small but fierce club of women who are proving they can defend their countries uh, as well as any man. In Norway, they... Um, <laughs> They have made increasing the proportion of women in the armed forces a top priority and passed a bill just a few months ago expanding military service opportunities for women. We are beginning to see similar outcomes uh, globally. And the effort we are launching today will keep this progress going and will foster the spirit of learning and collaboration 
that is needed to fully implement Resolution 1325. In Afghanistan, the Institute for Inclusive Security joined with the Afghan Women's Network to train dozens of women in conflict resolution. So far, those women who are well-trained and ready to help try to explore ending the decades-long conflict are not being fully utilized. I hope that changes. In Ghana, the Canadian International Development Agency joined with the West Africa Network for Peace Building to hold trainings in peer mediation to help settle local disputes. A brilliant idea. I applaud the Ghanaians and the Canadians because it is often these local disputes that unfortunately seed the ground with conflict that can spread much more broadly. Japan's International Cooperation Agency is working with the Institute on Women, Peace, and Security here at Georgetown to research how to make responses to humanitarian emergencies more gender sensitive and effective. And I thank the Japanese government because this is a huge problem. Again, women often bear the humanitarian load of caring for themselves, caring for their children in the midst of or in the aftermath of conflict. Well, how do we get what is needed into the hands of women so that they can better protect and feed and clothe and shelter uh, their children? This kind of collaboration is what the National Action Plan Academy is all about. And over the next few days, both our delegations and interested uh, students, faculty, and observers will have the opportunity to learn from one another and map out how to continue improving implementation of national plans, focusing particularly on advancing military effectiveness in dealing with these issues. You will hear today from some currently serving and retired military officers who have been great partners in trying to figure out how we translate this idea that women need to be at the center of peacemaking and peacekeeping into reality. I'm confident that we can make great progress together. Now, it's in that spirit that I am delighted to help launch an important new book from the National Defense University. It is aptly titled, Women on the Front Lines of Peace and Security. I was very proud to co-author the foreword, along with former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. Leon and I thought that if we were both there in the foreword, both diplomats and military professionals would see both of our names and think maybe there's a way we can cooperate more closely <laughs> together. Uh, so please welcome Ambassador Wanda Nesbitt from NDU, who will speak to us about this important project. Thank you very much, Secretary Clinton. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to say very briefly that this book is the culmination of three years of work, uh, primarily by many of my colleagues at NDU, as well as particularly the NDU Press. Um, it is my privilege and my honor to be here to represent the National Defense University for the launch of this important work. It is a collection of what I would call testimonials rather than articles by military personnel as well as civilian, many well-known members of the military and the civilian world talking about the impact that they have seen in the real world that can be had when women are placed at the center and when women are given a chance to play the role that we all would like to see them play. For those of you who may not be familiar with the National Defense University, our mission is to develop strategic leaders. And so our students are people who are usually halfway through their careers, both military and civilian. They come from all of the different military services, from all of the foreign affairs agencies, and from countries all over the globe. And we hope to transform them into leaders who will be able to think both critically and creatively, understand complexity, and view problems holistically. And so our hope is that this book will deepen the understanding of our students, as well as people far beyond NDU, that it will enable them to, to place this issue into an operational context, and that it will help them to be able to see the issue of women in peace and security as one that is relevant to the work that they do on behalf of their country every single day. 
If I could just take one moment, I would like to thank a few members of NDU who were involved in this project. I would particularly like to thank Nayla Arnas for the incredible work that she did along with uh, Ambassador Verveer in shepherding the project. I want to recognize Bill Eliason and his team at the NDU Press, Dr. John Church, Joanna Syke, Dr. Jeffrey Smotherman, who did a superb job as the lead editor. And I also want to acknowledge the work of Marca Gianni at the government printing offices who did the entire layout. Um, the credit for this really goes to them. They did the hard work. Um, but we are very proud that NDU could be part of this event. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank Steve McGann, who has um, a colleague of mine from the State Department who has begun the first writing award at NDU the first university-wide award to a student who wants to write about women, peace, and security. Uh, we gave out uh, two awards so far in the past two years, and we're looking forward to a larger number of students, perhaps with the use of this book, contributing to that award this year. So Secretary Clinton, on behalf of NDU, may I present to you? Thank you so much. Women on the front lines of peace and security. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I believe, Ambassador, that this book will have an impact on students at NDU and far beyond. Now I am pleased to welcome the Minister of Defense from Norway. Uh, she and her country are real leaders in the cause of women, peace, and security, and terrific partners uh, to us all. Minister Serede, please. Secretary Clinton, Ambassador Babir, Milan. I would like to say, distinguished professors, dear students and guests, it's a great honor to be able to address you here this morning on such a very interesting and also very important topic of smart power and inclusive leadership. I met with Milan in Oslo just almost a week ago, and we discussed some of the issues that we were supposed to be discussing here as well and I've been looking forward to this ever since. And I would also like to uh, accomplish uh, a very warm thank you to her for her leadership over years in doing this, and also to the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security, a spearhead, in my opinion, in actually advocating these issues. And to Secretary Clinton, and she doesn't know this, but I have to, to say it. When I was participating in the UN General Assembly in 2009, I attended a meeting she was sharing on 1325. In the middle of the meeting, my party chairman called me, asked me if I wanted to become chairman of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee of the Norwegian Parliament. That was a very timely call because sitting in that meeting, being so inspired, I said yes. <laughs> and I think that she has, in a way, some sort of stock in the fact that I'm standing here today as defense minister. And I, I have kept with me and used several times after that meeting one thing she said at the end of that meeting. When asked about violence against women, she replied, it's not cultural, it's criminal. And I think that is a very good way of answering it. My aim this morning is to try to provide some um, overarching points on these issues and also illustrate them with some examples. But first, I think we need to take a quick look at our surroundings to provide a backdrop for this discussion. We live in an increasingly complex and also unstable world. Our values of humanity and dignity, of human rights and the rule of law are challenged by and in a lot of areas, by forces that tries to destabilize everything we have accomplished. Those forces are regressive by nature, and they are undermining things that we have done so far. And let me give you three quick examples. These forces are in play in Ukraine, where Russia has violated fundamentals of international law through its illegal annexation of Crimea, and continued destabilization of Ukraine. In the Middle East and beyond, where ISIL, through almost unthinkable atrocities, 
aim at establishing their so-called caliphate that would in fact enslave and degrade the population and where women are reduced to mere commodities. In Nigeria, where Boko Haram are deliberately targeting civilians, including young girls attending school, in their quest to establish an oppressive regime where they can strip people of their basic human rights. For us to succeed in meeting these challenges, we need a strong value-based platform based on human rights and on the one basic truth that women's rights are human rights. It is not something else, something in a different basket or something less. And we also have to realize even the most modest goals will not be possible to reach unless we engage men. Personally, I have to say, I get a bit annoyed sometimes when we, women, seem to think, and we do this all the time, that we can gather in seminars, talk about all the wrong thing men does, <laughs> with all women and no men in the audience and assume that they will step up, take leadership, and make this world a better place. <laughs> I, I do think, I do think the time has come to engage men on a broader agenda, to involve them, to make them become agents of change. An important part of such a value-based platform is the Security Council Resolution 1325. From the Norwegian government, we are currently doing our third revised action plan. And we are four ministers carving it out together. We're benchmarking, we are measuring, but when we think smart about inclusive security, we're in for the long haul. All of us, Norway included, still has a long way to go and we need to urge all countries to actually have action plans and to follow through. But why do we engage? First and foremost, of course, because both war and the peace and stability and struggle for it are too important to be left to men alone. Women are overrepresented by those hardest hit when war and conflict rage. They are underrepresented by those carving out the solutions. There can be no lasting peace when half the population is excluded. Women need to be part of the decision-making process and also have prominent roles in conflict resolution. Remember, as Secretary Clinton said, women are not only the victims, they're also important actors. And on that note, from a military and defense policy perspective, the 1325 agenda is not primarily about gender equality. It's more specifically about capability and operational effectiveness. This is not uh, sisters are doing it for themselves agenda. <laughs> this is honoring the commitment to women, peace and security through obtaining the best effect and the best results. Let me give you three examples, one from Afghanistan and two from Norway. Operational lessons from Afghanistan strongly suggest that a better gender balance in military units will improve performance, situational awareness, and force protection. In a country like Afghanistan, it's the women, not the powerful men and the elders in the villages, that carry with them the key to families and to communities. Norwegian special forces are among those who have the most extensive experience from Afghanistan. So in Kabul, our special operation forces units over years have built a program where they select, train, and integrate women into police counter-terrorist operators. It's a very successful project, in, and it has proven to have great operational output. Applying a gender perspective in military operations can, in other words, be decisive in order to be able to fulfill our mandate. It creates better access, and it can also help removing ceilings for local women making themselves heard in their own power structures. 
And now my first Norwegian example. Our special forces is also a unit with rigorous physical requirements. A number of female soldiers serve in the special forces, but not as special operating forces operators. Even so, the SOF strongly advocates the operational value of female operators. So they are currently running a test program to train and prepare a unit of female soldiers for the selection phase. These soldiers have been tested and selected in several rounds. 327 women applied, 13 were in the end accepted, and they will again be able to compete on equal footing with male applicants to recruitment as operators. The experiences so far are very good. They have performed better, both mentally and physically, than many expected, and they seem to have an even stronger sense of duty than their male colleagues. <laughs> this is no surprise to us, I suppose. But Colonel Eide Christoffersen, um, he was the then commander of our Army Special Operations Command. He had the idea, he started this groundbreaking work, and he was awarded with the Armed Forces Gender Equality Prize for 2013 for his work. He's now a student at the US Army War College, as well as one of our most highly decorated soldiers after World War II. And I brought him with me today. Eide he is the true agent of change. And then, as Secretary Clinton mentioned, my second Norwegian example is that we, in October, passed a law in Parliament that gives universal military conscription from January 1st next year. A gender-biased law on, um, con on conscription has proven untenable in a modern society. It meant that we were missing out on half of the nation's human resources. And why should we? And in a society where you have an equal division of rights, you should also have an equal division of duties. This is a good step, but of course it's not sufficient. In 1985, Norway removed the combat exclusion rule. We still have challenges, but we also have very good role models in all serving in all parts of our armed forces, be they submarine commanders or door gunners, but they are there because they are the best ones in the job. Last year, Elisa Toft was the first woman uh, since World War II received a highly rated decoration for her duties during combat in Afghanistan. She underlined one thing very strongly. She was awarded the medal because of her accomplishments as a soldier, not as a woman. My ambition is that stories such as these will replace the bias myths on inclusive security being soft or female participation in our armed forces is a part of a gender quota. It's about time that we get rid of that uh, illustration and I think it's about time that we start discussing what this is all about, operational effectiveness and doing right things for our armed forces. Thank you. We have a tradition here at Georgetown to uh, have the students ask a couple of questions, or sometimes if we have time, more than a couple. Uh, that is not this morning. Uh, but uh, we had many submissions and a committee uh, looking at those submissions, a faculty student committee, and I have a question for each of you. Uh, we'll start with you, Secretary Clinton. How can men in decision-making positions facilitate the inclusion and utilization of the expertise of women in such conflict zones as Syria and in Ukraine? And this comes from a male student uh, Colby Wilborn, a graduate student in German and European studies. Well, I think it's a great question, and it really uh, follows off of the points that the defense minister was making. Uh, I think that, uh, let's take Ukraine first. 
Uh, Ukraine will have to, and I hope it receives significant help in doing so, rebuild its military forces. Uh, and that is going to be a uh, priority uh, if they expect to be able to defend themselves going forward. They've been quite effective uh, up until now without adequate training equipment and with some of the legacy problems that uh, previous Ukrainian governments uh, left for the military. In so doing, they should take a page from what the defense minister just said and make it at least possible for women to be uh, in positions of military and civilian authority and activity in defending uh, their country. Uh, that is uh, a challenging uh, concept for many to take on. Um, I first went to Ukraine with Milan, who is of Ukrainian uh, ancestry and still speaks Ukrainian. And so I know uh, just a little bit about the country and some of its challenges. Uh, but the more that those of us who wish to help, and I think you heard the defense minister speak very strongly about the importance of helping Ukraine, and I hope other European countries, the United States, will be there for them as they undertake this uh, defense buildup and better training, better equipping, uh, and they should not eliminate women uh, from the get-go. And that should be in both, as I say, civilian uh, capacities and even opening up uh, potential military uh, positions. Syria is a much more challenging uh, environment in which to uh, undertake that kind of uh, uh, broader view about women's roles. Uh, Syria is now a multi-sided conflict. Uh, the uh, continuing uh, role of the Assad government propped up by Iran uh, and most particularly through Hezbollah acting uh, on behest of Iran in supporting Assad. Uh, military support, money and equipment still coming to Assad from Russia. And then this proliferation of non-state actors, many of which are uh, extremist groups who unfortunately fall into the category of being regressive, retrograde. It's not only now a fight against Assad, it is a fight to seize and hold territory and to establish uh, their own uh, governance, if you will, and there seems to be no role for women. Uh, so part of what we have to do in continuing to try to uh, combat the uh, depredations and criminal conduct of a group like uh, you know, ISIS, uh, and continuing to put pressure on Assad is probably first and foremost a protective uh, humanitarian approach toward women uh, in Syria who have again borne the brunt of this brutal conflict now for years. Uh, and I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to see much change on that front in the short term, but I would just end by uh, mentioning the Kurds because the uh, there are Peshmerga units that are fully integrated. There are even all-women Peshmerga units. There has been some publicity given to Kurdish women uh, fighting alongside their brothers or fighting on their own behalf. Um, and we should do what we can to support uh, those women uh, who truly are on the front lines in protecting uh, their communities against uh, this extremist uh, threat from ISIS and others. Thank you. Uh, Minister, this question comes from an undergrad uh, in the School of Foreign Service, Annabelle Timset. Uh, she asks, earlier this year, you gave a speech at the 2014 Army Summit where you discussed the changing future of war and of your country's military force. You told us a little bit already, but can you tell us more about what you think the future holds for women in the Norwegian Armed Forces and how their role will evolve as wars become more transnational and volatile? Well, that's, um, that's a good and a big question. Um, I will uh, try to make my answer not as long as I could have made it because it's a, I mean, it's a speech in itself, I think, to answer all the parts of that question. But... I think that we have to realize that not only for women, 
but for soldiers uh, as a whole, things are changing. The way we conduct war, the way we uh, conduct peace is completely changed now compared to some years ago. And that means that we need to recruit from a broader base. When I say that we need to recruit women, that is, of course, extremely important part of it. But we also need the geeks, to be honest. And I'm saying that because we also have a completely new area of fighting nowadays, cyber warfare. And unless we have the smart brains who can do the defense and the programming that we need, we will not be able to perform our conventional warfare as well, or our peacekeeping. So that means that we need to be able to both recruit and keep more, a more diverse course of soldiers. And that means for, for the female part of it, of course, making it an attractive place to be. And I think we're getting there. We still have work to do, but we're getting there. And that goes for all other aspects uh, as well. And we're trying new things. Uh, let me give you one example that I, I briefly mentioned for Milan and Oslo. We have been, um, on a voluntary basis, putting male and female soldiers in the same rooms. So they sleep in the same room in barracks. Our researchers were very, very skeptical. I was a bit skeptical. Um, and I thought this could never work. And we do it in some units, and it's on a voluntary basis. The result is quite amazing, in my opinion. The researchers were also very surprised. What we see is that when you put male and female soldiers together in a room, then suddenly everything is about being a soldier, not being a man or woman. And I think that is interesting. What we saw was that the rates of, for instance, harassment went down. Uh, and we cannot do this anywhere. And it's, it has to be voluntarily. But I think it's an interesting example of how armed forces are evolving. Uh, so you have the girls and the boys, you have the geeks of both genders, um, and all of them has a place in modern warfare and modern peacekeeping because it is so diverse. You need so many different competencies. And I think that we are slowly, slowly getting there. Thank you so much, Minister. Let's thank uh, Secretary Clinton and Minister Soraiti, that's all we have time for in this segment, but we thank you so very much. And now to continue this conversation, we have a very, very distinguished panel. As I introduce them, I'm gonna ask them to come up to the stage. Uh, first, Akihiko Tanaka, who assumed the presidency of the Japan International Cooperation Agency in 2012. JICA is one of the most generous national development agencies, and Mr. Tanaka should feel very comfortable here at Georgetown because he comes from a distinguished career in academia. He was a professor of international politics at the Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia at the University of Tokyo. He has held several top posts at the University of Tokyo and has written several books on themes relating to international politics and foreign policy. Welcome, President Tanaka. <laughs> Ambassador Mariette Sherman is the newly appointed special representative of the NATO Secretary General for Women, Peace, and Security. She is a career diplomat of the Netherlands and has served in a variety of posts in Europe and Africa, several of which have been in areas of conflict. Please welcome Ambassador Sherman. Major General Adrian Foster is the Deputy Military Advisor in the Office of Military Affairs at the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. He has, he has served in the British Army for 33 years. He has specialized in peace support operations and the human resources field. And he's been engaged in a number of multinational assignments from Sierra Leone to Iraq to Bosnia. Welcome, General Foster. And General Daniel Leaf 
is the director of the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, a Department of Defense institution in Honolulu. He retired from the Air Force in 2008 after more than 33 years of service, during which he undertook countless assignments, the last being deputy commander of the U.S. Pacific Command. Upon his military retirement, he was an executive at Northrop Grumman Information Systems. So thank you also for joining us, uh, General Leaf, and now we will have our conversation. It's hard to know uh, what questions to ask such a distinguished group, so I'm gonna start with one each and then turn to those in our audience uh, to uh, have an opportunity to do so as well. Uh, Dr. Tanaka, Prime Minister Abe has laid out Japan's commitment to the promotion of women in peace and security. Can you explain why this is a top priority for your government and what kind of assistance JICA provides in this area? I know you've been very engaged in Afghanistan, for example, but also in so many other areas in conflict or post-conflict. Well, thank you, uh, Ambassador Bavia. It's a great uh, honor uh, to be at Georgetown. Um, as I said, um, I'm an academic by training, and uh, I feel uh, very much uh, comfortable in the academic setting. Um, as um, uh, you just mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, was uh, very forthful uh, in his uh, uh, addresses to the UN uh, General Assembly last year, this year, uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, providing uh, safety to women under armed uh, conflicts. And uh, he um, uh, the uh, directed the foreign ministry to uh, immediately prepare uh, the uh, national action plan uh, under resolution 1325. And uh, here I uh, see a clear um, manifestation of political leadership of uh, indicating what is important for a country like uh, Japan, uh, which depends so much on um, the peace and stability uh, of the entire world. Um, we at JICA, uh, which has been working uh, um, in 150 countries uh, with 92 overseas offices, uh, conducting various activities of development cooperation, um, we considered um, the value of human security uh, very much. So from our viewpoint, the Prime Minister's direction uh, was uh, quite helpful. Uh, to increase our uh, activities, um, to uh, uh, let women participate in all kinds of uh, decision-making uh, under armed conflicts, as well as natural disaster. Um, and we, uh, our efforts of provide uh, uh, empowerment activities in the countries, in, in the places like Mindanao. Secretary Clinton just mentioned uh, the role that um, uh, females played in negotiating uh, um, aspect. But then, uh, from our viewpoint, um, the, um, we had two prominent women uh, who uh, played a very important role in encouraging us to join the peace process in Mindanao. The first was a late diplomat, uh, Taeko Takahashi, who initiated that. And then uh, the second is uh, my predecessor, Madame Sadako Ogata, who insisted we involve in the peace process. And during that process, we uh, set up vocational training center in the MILF ruled areas for empowering uh, women uh, in uh, that region. I think we are very proud to be part of that process, uh, uh, reaching at a comprehensive peace agreement now. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for everything JICA does. And uh, I think your point about political will is, is very well taken. General Foster, um, you have argued, and I love this quote, I would put it every place. That gender is no longer an optional add-on. It is an operational necessity. So can you elaborate on why you've said that? 
and how, maybe how that plays out uh, in uh, the way the UN peace support operations um, go forward. Well, thank you very much. Um, as um, I was in the Congo for four years as the Deputy Force Commander, and now I'm the Deputy Military Advisor in, in New York for peacekeeping operations. Uh, and through my experience, I'm absolutely convinced uh, that gender is fundamental uh, factor to operational effectiveness. We have in UN peacekeeping at the moment uh, 16 missions, of which 10 are, have protection of civilians as the primary task. 50% of those civilians that we need to protect are female. How do we do that? Well, one absolute uh, key is to make the connection. Make the connection with females so that we understand what the threats are, where they're coming from, where the challenges are, where their concerns are, so that we can do something about it. One critical aspect in that, in making that connection, uh, is having the right people with us, wearing a blueberry to do that job. Imagine females in villages traumatized over a number of years through men wearing uniform. How can we make that connection if we have men wearing uniform but with a blueberry? It is very difficult. And that is why we in uh, the Department of Peacekeeping are pushing very hard to increase uh, the number of female peacekeepers. At the moment, it's only about 3%, and we need more. We need a considerable number, because it is operationally necessary for us to make that connection. But it goes further than that. Not only do we need to make the connection and understand the need, we then need to dial that in uh, to our operational plans. That need needs to feature right up front in terms of our planning, our core planning. And that needs to be done by every peacekeeper, male or female. And that is why we are pushing hard now to make sure that gender advisors are fielded in every mission, sitting alongside the force commanders. Uh, and today, indeed, um, I have our own uh, Office of Military Affairs gender advisor here, uh, Colonel Harnet Segi. Uh, from Ethiopia, a commander of a battalion in her own right from Ethiopia. And I can't point her out because of the bright lights, but I know she's there. Maybe somewhere. she could there stand she, up. There she is. There she is. <laughs> and so I come back to the point that it isn't an add on, it is absolutely crucial uh, to our operational effectiveness uh, that we consider this uh, in the future. And I'm glad to say that we're, we're starting it, but as um, Secretary Clinton has already said, we can do more. We need to go from the, uh, the talking to the doing. Uh, and therefore, I, I'm using this opportunity, amongst others, uh, to advocate for more female peacekeepers. And I hope that the audience today will go from here and do some advocating for me. Thank you, General. So from the uh, policy making to the doing, uh, Ambassador Sherman, how is NATO implementing uh, the national action plan that it has on women, peace, and security um, in the varying places that NATO is now uh, operating? Is it different in Afghanistan, uh, in Kosovo, in Ukraine? Uh, can you tell us about that and how the principles of 1325 are relevant in these places? Well, so that is a very large question. But I think, um, uh, first of all, thanks to all the previous speakers that highlighted so many important points. I can maybe go a bit further um, through that agenda. Um, I think, first of all, for NATO, the most important thing was to um, adopt Andorra's uh, its revised policy and, and a very specific and targeted action plan. And it's very important to point out that the NATO action plan for implementing Resolution 1325 has been endorsed by more than 50 countries, so all 28 allies and its partners. So it's not only for NATO as an institution, it's very much a collective agenda. 
and what the, Nor the Norwegian Minister of Defense pointed out, um, a value-based platform. 1325 very much serves as a value-based platform. It allows us to enter into very practical cooperation with partners, not only with our members, our allies, and our partner nations, but specifically also with other international organizations and civil society. Um, now, looking at you know, the three areas that you mentioned, you know, how do we try to do this in Afghanistan, Kosovo, and Ukraine? Obviously, it depends very much on the context, the situation, and our mandates. And as you know, we don't have boots on the ground in Ukraine. It's not an operation we do have in Kosovo and Afghanistan. Um, but it starts all with, I think, applying a gender lens with what we do in order to see sharper and to be smarter in what we do, to understand how insecurity affects the population, both men and women, boys and girls, how we can mitigate the negative effects of insecurity and crisis, um, what we do, how that impacts on that situation, and how to empower men and women, agents of change, to more constructively contribute to a peaceful future and stability. Um, so it all applies on the analysis. And obviously we have a host of lessons learned in Afghanistan and Kosovo in our uh, missions. And I think that practical experience allowed us basically to know in practice what the relevance is of uh, empowering women from becoming mainly victims and vulnerable to active players and assets in finding sustainable peace and security. We've le learned that in practice in Afghanistan and Kosovo, we have many practical best practices that we developed there, including, um, as was already mentioned by others, um, um, female engagement teams, uh, female searches during the election in Afghanistan, which allowed women to come out and vote. Um, but also the importance, as was also highlighted by the colonel, of the having enough female in our own forces so that we can better engage with local population and particularly with, with, with women, have better information, be more effective in what we do, um, reduce our own risks, and empowering women to become active in shaping the future of their own communities and creating resilient communities. So there's many, many lessons learned. I think what we have done um, now for Afghanistan, for instance, the Resolute Support Mission, the whole planning process, um, gender perspective has been part and parcel of that process for the first time. A gender perspective and impl um, implementing Resolution 1325 is part of our operational plan for Resolution Support Mission. So it's not, no longer an afterthought. In our planning tools, it has become part and parcel also in our training um, and in preparing troops um, in having enough gender advisors, gender advisors also at the highest level, directly in the command structure, in the highest command, that has a huge impact on our own effectiveness. But it doesn't mean that we have, you know, that we are there yet. And I think, to be honest, if we look at the challenges ahead, I think there's maybe two major challenges. First is to lift our lessons learned and what we learned from the women in Kosovo and Afghanistan to other crises and to new security threats as have been highlighted yet. So to move beyond Afghanistan scenario. And that is the second challenge I think is linked to that. It's not only about um, empowerment of women in the areas where we operate, but it's also very much about reducing the barriers for active and meaningful participation of women in our own structures. And I think the new emerging crisis that we have, that we've confronted with, like in Ukraine, make it very clear, this is not only a far away place, this is about our own security. How do we see our own peace and security? How do we protect the values on which we build the post-Second World War in terms of equality, equal rights and freedoms. To what extent is that under pressure and to what extent applying a gender lens will help us to more effectively respond to those new crises. So to come back on Ukraine, this is one of the things we're trying to do to see, first of all, how the insecurity affects the population, how we can mitigate the risks and better respond, how we can give a place at a table and a voice to the women in Ukraine, but also how it reflects on our own security. What it, 
means in order to increase also the number of women in our own security forces, security structures, and how we defend the core values that we created um, these international institutions on. Thank you. Obviously, a, a lot to, to uh, process uh, in terms of what needs to be done. Before I call on General Leaf, uh, perhaps those with questions can get their questions ready and begin to line up uh, so you can put them to the panel. Uh, General Leaf, you are known as a strong advocate for inclusion. I understand this is your top priority at the Asia Pacific Center for Security. Uh, but you come from a culture, the military, fighter pilot, uh, it's not exactly a culture that's well known for inclusion. So why do you feel so strongly about this and how do we go forward in this space? Thank you for that question, Ambassador Revere, and for allowing me to participate on this esteemed panel. I'm going to resist the temptation to restate or add to the evidence already presented on the value of inclusion um, and simply answer the question. There's an approach. The my commitment to security sector inclusion and women, peace, and security is not in spite of my background, it's because of my background. As a fighter pilot, what doesn't work or doesn't work well isn't merely uninteresting. It'll kill you. As a commander, if you leave anybody in your organization on the sideline, if you don't leverage what they can contribute, your unit is less effective, whether it's in war fighting, humanitarian assistance, peacekeeping, any operation. It's an operational imperative. So naturally, it, 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 I gravitate to what works, and inclusion works. In business, and I did spend some time in that world, inclusion and inclusive workforce does what? It makes more money. It works. So as I took my role at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, or on the behalf of the Department of Defense, we conduct security sector education. And I looked at improving our responsiveness to our tasking to promote stability, security, and cooperation throughout the Asia Pacific region and improve, increase US and partner capacity in security matters. The single best investment I could make, both for the United States and every country except North Korea that attends our courses and participates in our workshop is to promote an inclusive approach to security and to promote women, peace, and security. So it's because of my background, not in spite of it. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. So now anyone with questions, we just ask that you state your name and if you're a student, what school you're in and to whom you're directing your question. Hello, um, my name is Bethan Saunders. I'm a sophomore in the school of, um, undergraduate sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. Um, this is more of a general question um, for the panel, but my question is what type of conflict do you think is most acute for women, um, the effects of, you know, the effects of the conflict on women, and how is, how can we address specific conflicts where um, there's more threat to women and how we can empower them in the peacekeeping role. I'd like to take that. I think that uh, as you look at the history of conflict, uh, sexual violence has been a component throughout time. But what we see emerging, in my estimation, is a trend of using sexual violence against women as an asymmetric weapon. It's no longer the norm. It's not a, a norm to be part of conflict, but transnational groups like ISIS are using it as an asymmetric weapon to tear at the fabric of the societies they're attacking and to degrade the rule of law to create a power vacuum for them to fill. Well, maybe just on the on a sort of peacekeeping aspect, I, I would say that um, I put another perspective on that, and that is to, uh, to emphasize the point about, we often use the term um, presence equals protection. Um, and so we've done a lot of work now to, to identify um, where we can actually be of 
uh, great help uh, in reassurance and in prevention of um, SGBV. Uh, now, uh, for instance, in the, the Kivus in the DRC, we only have, on average, at the very best, one peacekeeper per 16 square kilometers. So we have to make difficult choices as to where to put our people. Uh, and uh, to that end, a lot of analysis now goes into, and we're encouraging it more and more, uh, in this business of professionalizing peacekeeping, to identify where um, our presence is absolutely vital. And let me bring it back to um, the threats on females. Uh, specifically, we, we've identified that areas such as when they go collecting firewood, the routes to those, they are very vulnerable in those areas. So we put peacekeepers there. We also, on markets, go into markets on a Saturday morning. Um, they're very vulnerable. And of course, those that lay in wait, preying on uh, those uh, females, vulnerable females, uh, we know now greater where they are uh, and we can put a presence in those areas. Um, likewise, uh, in markets, uh, trying more and more to make them weapons free, searching people before they come in. Um, all elements whereby we're trying to reduce the vulnerability. Next. Thank you. Good, um, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Ségolène Dufour-Jensen. I just received my master's from the School of Foreign Service. And I was wondering if you could address the question of scaling up the efforts and what your strategies have been um, in your various organizations to scale up efforts to include women in peace and security. Could I? Um, well, I think there are many um, uh, good examples of um, um, participation and uh, the um, empowerment um, of uh, females under uh, conflict-affected situations, as well as, from our viewpoint, uh, the natural disaster. And, uh, from our experiences, um, the, uh, uh, there are some types of uh, uh, good practices. Um, um, for example, uh, we are uh, doing in uh, uh, training police officers, female police officers in Afghanistan. And uh, also, uh, we have been doing similar things in uh, uh, DRC. Um, uh, these um, efforts, uh, together with our partner countries as well as um, uh, international organizations, wherever uh, there are opportunities, uh, we uh, would uh, promote scaling up. Uh, so that uh, that could be the foundation of um, uh, empowering uh, women as well as uh, encouraging uh, the government to uh, accept participation of more females in the process of peacemaking. Thank you. Thank you, and that's really an important point, and I think JICA, uh, as you said, is always looking for ways to scale up those good practices. Next. Hi, I'm Rukmani Bhatia, also a recent graduate of Georgetown SFS. I wanted to ask you about data and this topic. I understand that including women in armed forces and peacekeeping forces makes them more effective. What do you think are your strategies to provide hard data to show that? That's one of our next strategic challenge at APCSS in uh, women, peace, and security. We've increased the participation, nearly doubled it. We've added subject matter to the curriculum. But while the data exists, has it been synthesized into a way that is relevant, meaningful, and compelling to our fellows, our students? And I don't think it has. So our new WPS coordinator uh, is going to be charged with that, with building the intellectual underpinnings of substantive instruction on WPS, and I think it's a big challenge. Data exists. We've got to get more than data and, and convert it to uh, useful and compelling educational material. And as Secretary Clinton said, that evidence-based case is, is really important, I think, in everybody's work. Yes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Hutchison. I'm a second year in the Master of Science in Foreign Service program, and I had the privilege of being an Ambassador of Revere's Women, Peace, and Security class for the first time last year. 
Um, my question is about South Sudan and the conflict that's happening there right now. I worked there for a human rights organization before grad school, and I noticed the marginalization of women, yet also the incredible fountain of leaders there as far as women goes. And what the United Nations is doing right now with the protection of civilian camps and opening their gates to civilians, which was unprecedented before, is really impressive. But what I would like to know from you right now, as far as your recommendations go, what could they be doing while these women and girls and men and boys are in these camps that would help the peace process and encourage a behavioral change on the part of the population when you have them in these enclosed spaces? I'm going to ask Ambassador Sherman to take that because she spent time there. Yes, I also spent some time in Sudan. Um, and I think, uh, and on protection of civilians, I think a colleague from the PKO, uh, Colonel, can, can be more specific of what currently can be done. But I think there's a very other important aspect when we talk about the position of women in South Sudan. And this is not unique for South Sudan. We've seen and we really hear the same thing from women of uh, Afghanistan, other conflict um, affected areas. The conflict itself deeply uproots society and destabilizes society and destroys traditional structures that have been providing stability, prosperity and peace. And South Sudan is one of those tragic examples that as I was saying, traditionally amongst the tribes in South Sudan, it were the elder ladies who were the peace envoys so the women normally supported their tribes in going to fight and you know, um, steal some cows here and there. But when it got too bloody and got out of hand, they sent out their eldest women to negotiate a deal. And that traditional um, mechanism that kept the area stable and peaceful, and that at the time John Garang used to unite the different tribes in one front against the north of Sudan that allowed him to sign the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005. That structure is heavily um, disrupted and attached by um, targeted violence against women and local population. And I think it's our challenge not only to protect civilians, but to see how we can tap into the resource, the traditional role of women as peacemakers in South Sudan. That is, I think, our key challenge looking ahead. Well, because JICA has um, uh, operations in South Sudan, let me uh, say some of my observations. Um, um, the, uh, we have been conducting um, empowerment activities uh, in South Sudan, and as well as infrastructure uh, preparation. But then I uh, frankly have to admit that there are limitations that civilian organizations like us can do. When uh, the leaders of the countries decided to fight uh, each other. Uh, the efforts uh, of our uh, uh, organiza like organizations like us have certain limitations. We were about to start the, uh, uh, building a water supply system in the city of Juba when the two leaders uh, decided to fight again. Uh, General Foster, what about peacekeeping? In well, I was there when um, the fighting broke out um, uh, this time last year on the 15th of December and um, I will be back there next week. Um, and I have to say, I, I truly take my hat off to um, my colleagues out there um, for the, the fantastic work they're doing in abominable conditions. Uh, if you see some of those camps, particularly in the early stages, um, uh, and they were overwhelmed by uh, the numbers of people who were just seeking protection. But then the rainy season came as well, uh, and they were facing some real challenges. Um, I have to say that um, some absolutely extraordinary good leadership um, exhibited by uh, the a female SRSG, who, and I say this to everyone, um, I think she's been, and I've seen a lot of SRSGs, one of the very best at leading through such traumatic uh, circumstances. Now left that uh, mission, but uh, replaced by another female um, SRSG, and I know that she is doing very well as well. I think the, the challenges are huge. Um, I think actually uh, a, more, a few more female voices uh, in that dialogue might just help matters 
uh, to try and find a solution. Um, we've been there a number of times in terms of um, uh, stated uh, agreements. Um, they don't seem to uh, result in a, an end in the hostilities, but we're all hoping that will come very soon. Thank you. So thank you to the panel and to the students. We're going to have to end our, our Q&A session. Um, and now we have two video messages from two people who wanted to be here but couldn't. Uh, one is the NATO Secretary General, Jan Stolenberg, and the other is from former UN envoy in Afghanistan, now the UN envoy for Syria, uh, Stefan de Mistura. So if we could just quickly see those videos. Let me start by thanking Ambassador Weber for this opportunity to speak to you today. And I would also like to thank Hillary Clinton for her lifetime service to women, peace and security. And I have had the privilege to work with Hillary on many different issues, especially on child mortality and maternal health. And these issues are closely linked to the topic we are addressing today. Ensuring gender equality has always been important for me. It is a matter of principle. We simply cannot achieve lasting peace and security without engaging with half of the world's population. There can be no peace or security without full and meaningful participation of women. Women are especially vulnerable in conflicts, but they also play a critical role in preventing and resolving crises and rebuilding societies after conflict. For NATO, integrating gender perspectives into our activities makes us more modern, ready and responsive alliance. This year, NATO adopted an ambitious new policy and action plan on Security Council Resolution 1325 to demonstrate that inclusive security means better security. More than 50 allied and partner nations have committed to it. And we also continue to develop military guidelines to prevent and respond to sexual violence in conflict. And the role of women in our forces and gender advisors in particular has been key in our operation, such as in ISAF in Afghanistan. NATO is proud to be a leader in implementing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Gender equality isn't optional, it is fundamental. It allows us to respond better and smarter to the many complex security challenges we face today. So I wish you an excellent and productive symposium Ambassador Schumann, my special representative on women, peace and security, will engage directly with you on my behalf. Many thanks to all of you and to the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Thank you for having me with you, even if only by video. I would have loved to be present, but unfortunately I'm involved, as you know, in a Syrian conflict environment, and I am in the middle of a brainstorming on how to save a city, Aleppo, which we are working on. I want to salute very warmly those who are organizing it, Ambassador Vervea, and very warmly Hillary Clinton, with whom I've been working very closely, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I never forget when together we fought together for making sure there was a linkage in the Tokyo donor conference between donor funding and women improvement in Afghanistan. I've been 43 years in the conflict area, working 19 areas of conflict, including now Syria. And I can tell you in no place have I not seen women being a major player in helping us in our job, which is hopefully to produce a peaceful solution to a conflict. Let me give you some classical, typical example I lived through. One was Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik, a siege in the Balkans. It was medieval. 
those who organized the strategy for breaking the siege and to which I was honored to be part of was a group of women. They came up with the idea of using humanitarian entry point by evacuating people, men, women, children, and by doing so through military vessels, which then stopped the siege. And then they are the ones who actually produced also the outcome of a major concert at the end of the siege to send to everyone a message. You can bomb everything you want, but not our culture. Let me jump to another example, more close, Kobane. You must have heard about this city, has become iconic on the border between Turkey and Syria, has been attacked by ISIS, the terrorist organization, who is in charge of the resistance, a woman, a Kurdish woman, 40 years old. When we launched an appeal to make sure that uh, Kobani should not become another Srebrenica, the world responded. But who was behind the resistance in proving that uh, ISIS can be stopped and is stoppable was a group of 700 volunteers led by a woman. Last but not least, we are now in Aleppo. We are trying to work in order to make sure that we can respond to an appeal by a group of women who have been saying, whatever you do, but please stop this conflict. That's what I need, and that's what we are trying to work on. And that's why it's so important that you have this seminar, this workshop, because I think anywhere we can, we should have women involved in peace. They are very creative, and we need creativity apart from determination. Thank you. And to bring uh, the session to a close, I'm going to call on uh, Ambassador Swani Hunt, who is the founder the Institute for Inclusive Security, which has been a partner uh, in this endeavor, uh, and will be here with us over the next two days working with the delegations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make sure that everyone understands this is a watershed, this is a watershed moment. I, I'm going to speak to you as your mom, uh, okay, your grandmother. Uh, all right, and I'm going to say go home and write in your journal that you were here. And I'm not kidding. Write in your journal that you were here this morning. Uh, I, I, as you know, as Milan said, I'm representing the Institute for Inclusive Security. We did start at Harvard. They asked us to leave Harvard. I'm still there because we were two activists. <laughs> Do you like that? So it, it's actually now part of our family foundation, Hunt Alternatives. We put $80 million into the Institute for Inclusive Security, but all kinds of others, donors and, and countries. Thank you, Norway. Have, thank you, Norway. Where's Norway? <laughs> thank you, Norway. Yes, thank you. Uh, have put big dollars into making this happen. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't see change like this without partners. Uh, that's why working with Ambassador Revere is so key. We're learning this mega mega NGO, they're with us now going to create a graduate certificate in, guess what, inclusive security. Uh, the NDU, oh, NDU, where are you? I'm going to use the book in my course. I've been teaching 17 years at the Kennedy School. That's fabulous, thank you, I was needing some new curriculum, right? <laughs> and individuals like Sana Anderlini and Rina Amiri, uh, you know, it's, it, very, very early on making this happen. Um, the, hey, you all are so good. This is being videotaped, right? I'm using you. I'm using you in my course. So thank you very, very much. This, uh, I always, you know, got to keep it fresh, right? But you, you all are spectacular. Um, now, I want you all to imagine a map of the world. And as I read these countries, I'd like the, the 55 delegates to stand here. Um, Afghanistan, will you all stand up? Oh, everyone hold your applause. Afghanistan, stand up. Uh, ne Netherlands, Norway, Philippines, Serbia, US, Bosnia, Canada, Ghana, Indonesia. Now, everyone, please, let's thank them. Thank you. This, this, is, this is a cadre of catalysts. We've got innovators, we've got implementers. We've pulled together corporations with donors, civic leaders, and so I want you to realize that this is like 
This is like a, a, a lab here, an, an ideal lab, an action lab. I'm so glad Georgetown isn't going to kick us out for being two activists. Thank you very much. Uh, and, but when I think about Catalyst, there's another person, Ash Carter. Uh, you may have heard of him. And uh, he's in the news quite a bit right now. But when he was at the Kennedy School, before he went back to the Pentagon, he said to me, and to a bunch of others, uh, this is six years ago, he said, you know, Swanee, he was talking about all the different things people had accomplished at Harvard, and he said, Swanee, your idea about women and security, it's ahead of its time, but it's going to take off. And that's what's happening this morning. It's, it's taking off, and you're here. You're here, and in 15 minutes, the, this group, they're going to start this academy, and you are here making it happen. So it's, there's this alchemy right now going on, and the women we've worked with, for thousands of women, they've said security is more than bombs and bullets, and the policymakers that we've worked with, they represent the inclusivity, and that's how you get this world-changing idea of inclusive security. So... There are these iconic figures like Michelle Bachelet in, in uh, Chile or, or Emma Bonino in Italy. Um, we've got in the Philippines, Irene Santiago in Kenya, Wangari Maathai. I mean, everywhere around the globe. We look at Bosnia, including Serbia in their plan. We look at Azerbaijan, where women have put down their scarves in front of the men and said, you will not cross this scarf to go into conflict. I mean, the, the examples go on and on, but let me close by telling you one of my favorite, which is this, this summer in Nairobi, we had uh, delegations. It was like, a, um, it was like a, a beta for you know, testing out this idea. And we had 16 sub-Saharan uh, countries, delegations come together for about a week and exchange their ideas on how they did their national action plans. And the Ghanaians, the Ghanaians went back into their proverbs, and they had the most beautiful, which is, you can't feed yourself with one finger. You can't feed yourself with one finger. So you all, you're making it happen, and welcome to the feast. Go forward. So let me once again thank everyone, Swanee, for your leadership, to all the people in the seats who've come uh, for this intensive program that is about to begin, for being on the front lines of change, and for the extraordinary people up here on the stage uh, who have been great leaders because Political will means a great deal in this space, and we can't thank you enough for being here, but most especially for what you do every day. So thank all of you also for coming and for being supportive. I'm gonna ask that we allow the participants to please leave first, and then everybody else. Thank you all, and have a great day.